Okay, so this is part two of leadership. We're going to look at the academic theories or the leadership theory as it's grown up over time. And leadership as a discipline is only about um, maybe 70 years old, probably closer to 50 years. It's really on the, on the backside of World War II that we started thinking about it and it grew over time. Okay, so... When we first started thinking about uh, as scholars, as we started conceptualizing well, what is leadership, we said, well, what traits are there of good leaders? We said, well, you know, they have these physical abilities or, or personal personality characteristics, or maybe they're more cooperative or intelligent, or they have certain insight. And that's great. That got us some way. We could say, who, who are leaders, and then try to measure them up. But the trait theory really wasn't um, very adequate as far as a, uh, a body of research that could point to what is leadership or how does it function? And so we moved forward from that. But So let's look at this uh, scripture first. Uh, an overseer, and now here we're talking about within the church, as God's steward must be above reproach. Here are some traits. Okay, He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, or but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. These are traits. Okay, there are traits that are going to get you into trouble, and there are traits that are going to keep you out of trouble or show what where you actually stand. So this is kind of a, a way of looking at trait theory as, as what are qualifications for leadership. And again, this was within the church, but nonetheless, I think this is fairly transferable. If you don't do some of these things and do the other things that it prescribes, that's a proper way of approaching leadership. All right. Leadership behavioral studies theory. So you have uh, um, an autocratic style, a democratic style, or laissez-faire. Autocratic is simply a, di a dictatorship kind of style. Directive. Democratic style is more collaborative. Um, and then laissez-faire is you're not even there. You're just not doing it. This is really kind of not useful. Yes, it's bad to have a dictatorship. Yes, it's better to be somewhat collaborative. Why? Because you get to use other people's brains. It's not just your own. You're not so limited. And yes, it's bad to just not have any you know leadership there at all that's what laissez-faire is it's not really all that useful but it's one of the earlier theories as we're growing along leadership behavioral theory so here you have the ohio state studies i, I think i referenced that in a, in a different powerpoint uh, the ohio state studies had initiating structure and initiating structure and consideration so initiating structure is like the task so and consideration is like relationship and you'll see this with the michigan studies as well so Whenever we're looking at what do leaders do, we say, okay, well, they do these things about getting the job done. That's one half of it. And then they do these other things about relationships. That's initiating structure and consideration. Same thing with the Michigan studies. You call it something different, but it's production-oriented. That's task. And then there's employee-oriented leadership, which is people. Same thing when you get to the leadership grid. There's concern for people. That's the people side, relationship. And then there's concern for production, which is the task. Now, here on a leadership grid, they try to say, well, you know, you have the organization man. That's the middle of the road leader at 5-5. Five, five. So here's, here's 1 and here's 9. And here's one and here's nine. So um, they're looking at are you high, high or low on concern for production or concern for people? Again, that's task and relationship. Or you might have the authority compliance manager. They're all about task and not about people. It's kind of a dictator, right? Or you have the country club manager. That's the exact opposite. That's the person that's you know all about relationship. But uh, if work doesn't get done, it's okay. That's not good either. So then you have things like the team manager, which they say is, you know, this is where you should be. You should be 9-9. You should be both highly productive and highly relational. And, okay, well, maybe um, it seems to steer that direction. But there's times when you just kind of you have to ebb and flow between these things. This also leaves you with 1-1, one, one, which is you're not good at either thing and you shouldn't be in charge of anything or anybody. Uh, or paternalistic, father knows best. Here what you're doing is, um, you know, you're trying to use promises of reward and threats of punishment in order to manage not really all that good uh, or opportunistic where the person just moves around just trying to maximize his own self-benefit that's not good either but it's just a way of trying to think through um, what leaders do now we moved from the first question which what are leaders that's trait theory to what do leaders do which is uh what you saw with the behavioral theories that we just talked about into fielder's contingency theory and contingency theory is going to be different it's going to um classify the favorableness of the leader situation 
And it's going to look at the circumstances or the environment in which the leader finds himself in order to try to tell you what to do. It's overly complicated. I'm going to try to simplify. So Fielder uses, for example, the least preferred co-worker scale in which the, the leader ranks the person he least prefers to work with over his career. And the harder you are on that person, the more task oriented you are, according to the theory. And so that's your that that's how he gauges whether you're a task oriented or relational type of manager. Okay, and then so there's task structure, and that is, uh, is it a very clear task or is it ambiguous? And then you have position power. Do you have formal power or do you not have power at all? And then the leader member relations. Do you get along well with the people? And then he's going to try to create this elaborate system where he takes leader member relations and task structure and position power and say, well, look, if you're here, you should do this, and if you're here, you should do that. Uh, and so here's your favorable or unfavorable condition. So if you're here, let's say V, okay, uh, this is uh, one, two, three, four, five. Um, so your leader member relations are uh, moderate to poor and your task structure is strong and you are uh, structured and your leader position power is strong, then you're going to have this perception of a chance of being able to work through. You should be a high, L, um, high LPC relations oriented type of leader in this situation, but you'd be re really task oriented in these kind of situations. Does that make sense? Now, it's really, really, really overly complicated. Doesn't necessarily work, but it's a good attempt to try to work this out. The next thing was, uh, you can't see it behind um, me speaking, but path goal theory of leadership. And it's trying to do the same things. It's, it's looking at directive, what kind of behavioral style styles you have, directive, supportive, participative, or achievement oriented. And then he's going to look at the follower characteristics. So we're going to look not just at the leader, but we're going to look at the follower. And we're going to look at the workplace characteristics. And we're going to look at the follower path perceptions. And that will lead us to our follower goals. And all this is saying this. It, it, let me boil this down. You as a leader, your job is to identify what your employees need, clear a path to get there, knowing their specific needs. So you as the leader are going to do these things to help followers who have these characteristics in a particular environment clear a path in order to get to their goals. Okay? It's, it's that simple if you just boil it down. Vroom yet Njago uh, normative decision model is just saying, at what point do you have the right authority to do something? Do, do you have to, um, is it for you to decide or do you consult individually? Do you consult as a group? Do you facilitate or do you delegate? At what point do you, I mean, where is the decision going to be made? Okay, so it's all about the decision and where it's appropriate decision for a given situation. Uh, so if your people know where, you know, hey, I have the authority to decide or or you know you have the authority to decide that's you got to you have to know where um where that is otherwise you're going to run into some significant problems Hershey Blanchard uh, situational leadership model. So, again, some of these have some lesser um, academic soundness, and this is one that's not as sound, but it's in every textbook, and it is intuitively, it, it makes sense. So, if your subordinates are, say, low in maturity, you're going to kind of tell them what to do, and you're going to go through the process like that. As they as they get, um, you know, their, their sea legs, as they get better at what they're doing, uh, you can explain decisions to them and kind of sell them on the idea. As they get better and better, you're going to share ideas and they'll participate in it. And if they're really mature, you'll simply be delegating and letting them run with it. That's the idea behind situational leadership. It depends on the situation and you're dealing with both the relationship and the task behavior. And you're going to be dealing with it's good, but it's going to be based on the maturity level of the follower. Okay. So if the mature, so it's going to be follower directed if the maturity of the follower is high or moderately high, but it's going to be leader directed if they're unable, unwilling, or insecure, that's very low, or if they're just not there yet, then it'll be leader directed. That's the idea behind that one. Okay, leader member exchange. Let me try to make this simple. There are in groups and there are out groups. Okay, an in group are people that are already kind of connected to the leader. They want more responsibility. They um, have higher job satisfaction. They're 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 going to take on more because they they just want to be part of the team, as opposed to the out group who is just going to go by what was. Um, 
decided the the formal rules i'm going to do my job i'm not going to you know really get emotionally attached here uh, i'm going to uh, and and they're not really in the leader circle right they're they're just kind of they're managed by the formal rules it's, that's not bad they're just not they're, they don't have 100% they they're not all in as opposed to the in group which is all in um, substitutes for leadership are things like a satisfying task. You don't have to lead someone to do something that they naturally want to do. Uh, if they get feedback, that's helping them uh, as if somebody is coaching them. Uh, employees' high skill level or maturity, team cohesiveness, and other formal organization formal controls can substitute for leadership so that somebody doesn't always have to be there. Uh, developmental uh, developments in leadership theory. So we have transformational leadership, which is all the um, all the rage. So now the difference is between a transactional leader. Okay, as a transactional leader, I use formal rewards and punishments, and you know maybe you can get some things done that way. But a transformational leader is going to inspire and excite followers to achieve different higher levels of performance. There's a difference between trying to trying to I guess bribe somebody to do it and trying to get somebody to do something because they're really interested. Okay, that's the difference. Now, and this also talks about charismatic leadership. A charismatic leader is uh, one whose personal abilities and talents are, are really the core of why people are following. Now, that can be good or that can be bad. That could be Gandhi or that could be Hitler. Okay. In fact, some people like Peter Drucker are very um, not very impressed with char charisma as a, as a means of, of uh, using... Um, uh, uh, leadership. Uh, so the charismatic leaders use referent power, okay? And there's a potential for a high achievement and high performance, but there's also a potential for destructive and harmful courses of action, okay? So you got to be careful with that. Other emerging issues are things like emotional intelligence and trust. Trust is so core to leadership. If you don't trust your manager at work, there's leadership is evaporated. It, it's as important to leadership as oxygen is to fire, Okay, uh, women in leadership, and they have a whole different bundle of, of potential issues uh, in leadership. Servant leadership, which is um, just inverting the the organizational pyramid and thinking in terms of if you're at the top of the pyramid, you invert the pyramid. I'm carrying this whole pyramid. That's my goal. I'm serving. the The more people I'm in charge of, the more people I serve. Um, when we talked about uh, earlier, I, and let me go back a couple of slides. We were talking about. Um, Transformational leadership, where we're talking about I inspire and excite followers to higher levels of performance. What we mean by that is this. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and, and work. Rather, teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. Why? Because if they really, if they desire it, it'll come naturally. It's a, that's a different thing than just, you know, ordering people around and telling them do this and do that. No, help, help them desire the thing that, that you want to get to. Okay. Finally, um, we'll talk about types of followers. So you have uh, either passive or active, and then you have dependent or independent. And if they're passive and dependent, they're like sheep, right? I mean, that's just that's like the worst of all worlds. If they're passive and they're independent, they're alienated followers. That can be redeemed. Okay. If they're active and they're dependent. Then they become yes men, and that's just as bad as worthless as as the sheep. I mean, yes people are only telling you what they want to do to help themselves, but if they're active and independent, they become effective followers, and that's what you want of followers. Because you don't want followers, you want to build leaders. Finally, leadership is viewed differently in different cultures. So most of what I said is true in a Western European environment. It might not be understood the same way in, say, China or some other parts of the world. Leaders need to alter approaches when they're crossing national borders and get to know their people. In the same way, look, what I just told you, if you're going to China, let's say I'm just using that as an example because it, it is a very different culture. It's far more collectivist than the West. Um, but if you're going to some place like this, go and understand these people first. What I told you about leadership in the beginning is true. You have to know your people. But knowing these people that you're going to serve in China is going to cause you to act differently than some of the things that I talked about. So get to know them and understand them. Okay, finally, you know, when um, the scriptures offer us a lot of wisdom about leadership, Jesus called them together and said, you know that, the rule, the, that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. That means they're, they act like dictators. You don't want to do that. 
and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you shall be your servant. Whoever would be first among you shall be the slave of all. What's that mean? The higher you go in leadership, the more it is your responsibility to serve your people. That's the purpose of leadership. You, you want to go first. You are going first to clear the way, not to be in charge, to clear the way, to help your people get where they need to go. That's the purpose of leadership. Okay, thanks for your time. Uh, complete your assignments, and I'll talk to you next week.